All right, take your Bibles and turn to John chapter 15 this morning. John chapter 15 and verse 1 is where we're going to be. John chapter 15, verses 1 through 11. If you don't have a Bible, there are Bibles in the, in the chair in front of you underneath it. And you're welcome to take one of those and use it today. And if you don't even own a Bible, you're welcome to take that home. And that's our gift to you. So John chapter 15, verse 1, 1 through 11 today. How's everybody doing today? Everybody doing all right? Everybody survived that great blizzard from uh, last week? Everybody survived that? Good. Man, 2021, what a year, right? What a year. If you, uh, I want to say this. If you right now feel attacked, if you feel like you're under someone's thumb, if you feel or maybe wondering if you're dealing with spiritual oppression right now, if you're battling anxiety that at times is crippling, uh, Endless depression, malaise. I know this kind of sounds like a drug commercial, okay? But I, I want to say that if you feel like you're, you're dealing with those things, you're not broken. There is not something just innately wrong with you that's beyond repair. These are very, very tumultuous times. These are very difficult times. The past 10 months have really been one for the history books, really. I mean, if you think about this, I was thinking about this uh, last week, that just... Just about right at a year ago, over the course of 12 hours, we almost started World War III with Iran. That was a year ago. It was a year ago. That is something in a normal year that would have been talked about and unpacked and dealt with for months on end. That doesn't even register with us. We don't even think about that anymore, right? It doesn't even make our top 10 list of things that have happened in the year. On top of that, you know, one of the top five basketball players of all time dies in a, in a fiery helicopter crash. That doesn't even come to mind. Then a, then a worldwide pandemic hits, and, and, and now we have the whole whirlwind of all of that stuff, right? Like, so, so if you love healthcare workers and elderly people, don't wear masks, right? Don't do it if you love them. And then, well, if you love healthcare workers and elderly people, wear masks, right? Like, that's what we're dealing with. And then out of toilet paper, okay, right? And uh, may have to start using leaves. And, well, don't use those leaves. Those are actually poison ivy. And, and so, and, and then we think, like, if we, if we all just stay home, then we'll be safe and we'll survive. Not totally understanding the idea that it isn't a zero-sum game. That one of the, the lingering effects of isolation is depression and, and, and uh, drug use and substance abuse. In relational issues. It's not a zero-sum thing, stay home and be safe. Of course, we've got to deal with all of that, but, man, we're, we're going through it. And then, of course, what about the children? Right, what about the children? Well, should they go to school or should they not go to school? These are all the types of things we've dealt with in the last year. Should we keep them home and, and keep them safe? But, but then we realize over time that extended learning online isn't nearly as effective as we thought it would be. So... You know, so send them to school. But if you send them to school and, uh, sorry, your child was within two miles of another person who pet a dog with corona, and so now you must be home for 14 days, right? So that's what we got. Now, every time I, every time I sneeze, I wonder myself, like, is it the rona, right? Is it just a sneeze or is it a rona? And to top it all, is it going out on me, D? Is it popping? Let's see if this will work here. What's that? How's that? Is that working? Can you hear me? Is it popping? Okay. So every, every time, I don't know about you, but every time I sneeze, I wonder, like, is it a sneeze sneeze? Is it the Rona? And, and then to top all of that off, that we've just come through uh, one of the most heated and divisive elections in, in election cycles in decades. And so we come through all of that, and we tell ourselves that 2021 will be a better year, okay? And two weeks in, and Nope, that ain't true. That ain't happening. Not in any way. Man, 2020, those were the good old days, right? Like back in 2020. And of course, you know, now we're two and a half weeks in and new year, new me. And please, you are still eating Cheez-Its at midnight, right? Like that's exactly what's happening. Everything's the same. The Cowboys are still terrible. Nothing has changed. And, I, and of course, what I'm doing is trying to use a little humor to show us that in the words of... Uh, Granny Clampett from the Beverly Hillbillies, one of those great classic shows. We done been through it. We done been through it. 
And sure, if you look at it historically, what we're going through isn't as bad as the, the Great Depression or the Civil War or World War I or II. Historically, these times are probably on par with the upheaval in the 60s, okay? But it's okay to have real feelings right now and real emotions that you're working through because all that stuff's outside. That doesn't have to do with anything that maybe you're dealing with as a person or with the family. It's okay to not be okay right now of all times. And it would really help, and I would encourage you to talk to people about it. Maybe you need a counselor. Maybe you need a therapist. But probably what you need is just some great time with somebody you count as a good friend. And just unload. If you caught yourself doing it in the last month or two, you're catching up with somebody, and man, you begin to talk, and you feel like it's just word vomit. It's just all coming out. It's a sign of what you're going through. Maybe what we need is just to eat some good comfort food and talk through it. And one of the things I want to do for us as a church is put a full-on moratorium. Can I declare things? I declare, right, that, uh, that we stop answering right now. That how are you doing? I'm doing good. Because there really ain't a one of us where that's completely true. Get together, strengthen each other's hand in God. This year more than ever, I just want to say this, this year more than ever, you and I, what we need is we need church. We need the weekly gathering together as believers. We need to sing about the attributes of God, sing about the might and the salvation of God. We need the soul-strengthening, life-giving word. I know many folks are watching online. I'm so thankful that, that we're able to do that and provide that. And for like Presley Miller's leadership over a year and a half ago, we got started on that and really got ahead of the game before it even became something that was an issue. And many folks are watching online. And I would say those of you watching online, please continue to watch online until you feel like your family and you are safe to return. But I do want to encourage you, you need to return. And I want to encourage you to make uh, what, we, what I would call like a re-entrance strategy. I don't know what that is. I don't know if you want to wait till, till, till everybody's vaccinated. That's fine. Or maybe the, the case, and the infection rate is down to a certain point. But you need to start formulating a re-entrance strategy into the church. And those of you here today, we need to make a point to keep gathering. Now, it's not so that our little church and growing church can survive. We just saw in the announcements, the church has been around 175 years. It's probably going to be fine without you. Right? It's probably going to be fine without me. It's been 175 years. I don't know if pastors are even allowed to say that, but that, that's where it is. But we need church. We need the gathered church. We need to take part in it. Your family needs it. My family needs it. We need Jesus. Man, do we need Jesus. Online church is a great short-term substitute, but it cannot be a substitute long-term for the gathering of the people of God. And I feel this, this extra kind of like God-given weight today of that need for us to see Jesus. It's palpable. I think it's the times. I think it's everything. That's quite honestly why as a pastor I don't spend time in the pulpit talking about my political views or telling you that if you take these four vitamins in a cocktail, everything will be fine. That's why we don't have sermons here consisting of five tips to a healthier you in 2021 or, or how to turn that frown upside down. We have Dr. Oz, Dr. Phil, Judge Judy, the diabetes guy, and Jake Paul for all that kind of stuff. We don't need that. What we need is Jesus. Right? That's what we need. We need to be reminded constantly of his relentless love, his redeeming grace, his holiness, his awesome matchless power, his endless mercy. And what we need to do is drink from the well that never runs dry. And that's exactly what we're going to do today. Open our Bibles and just drink it up, soak it in, let it marinate. And man, I'm going to tell you this, we have the text for it. This isn't a text that we handpicked today. We, we uh, continuing our John series. Uh, we stopped it before Christmas to do a series on the Advent. This is the very next passage in this series, but I'm going to tell you, man, did God dial it up for us today. John chapter 15 and verse 1. Look there with me. I am the true vine. My father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. Every branch that does not that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. 
for apart from me you can do nothing. If anyone, verse 6, does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. But this, my Father, by this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you that, that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. Now in this text, in John chapter 15, we have the seventh of these statements, what we call the I am statements. It's the seven of them, that, the seventh one of, that, that Jesus mentioned through the first 15 chapters of John. I am the true vine. Okay? Jesus says that uh, prior to that, here's some of the other statements he's made. I am the bread of life. What does he mean by that? He means that there is satisfaction in him alone. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. What does he mean? That light, that true light is only found in him. It's only sourced in him. Jesus says that I am the door. What does he mean? That he alone grants entry to the Father. That he alone grants entry into eternity. Jesus says that I am the good shepherd. All other gurus are frauds. He is the good shepherd. Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. Believe in me and live. Jesus says, I am the way. I feel like it's popping on me, Bart. What do I need to do? What's that? Go to red mic. Just turn this off. Get me up here. And I can leave this alone. Let's crank this down a little bit, okay? So if these I am statements, right? I am the way, the one to God. And then here's Jesus saying, I am the true vine, the only source of life. All of his I am statements set him apart. All of them are exclusive. In other words, you have him saying, I am the resurrection and the life. There are no other resurrections in the life. I am the way. There are no other ways to God. I am the true vine. Every one of these famous statements by Jesus are exclusive to him. There are no other pathways to God. There are no other gurus. There are no other religions. Jesus leaves no room for others in these statements. Jesus is exclusively the way to eternal life. Paul puts it this way in Ephesians chapter 4. We have one Lord, we have one faith, we have one baptism. That's it. That's it. So Jesus is the true vine. So what does he mean by that? What does he mean all these in our passage here, all these vines and grapes? That sounds a little fruity, right? Dad joke, but that sounds a little fruity, vines and grapes. What are we, what are we talking about? Well, let me give you this today. Okay, let's start here. The true vine is, the, is one with the God of the Old Testament. The true vine is one with the God of the Old Testament. What do you mean by that? Well, Jesus says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. As soon as Jesus began to describe himself as I am, every one of these statements were significant. When Jesus started it that way, I am, his listeners immediately knew he was saying something significant. Whether they agreed with it or not, the Jews would have understood the significance of what Jesus was doing. In fact, the Jews crucified Jesus in part because he commits blasphemy in their minds. Because these I am statements, he is equating himself with the God of the Old Testament, the God of their fathers. And so for them, that's a no-no. In these I am statements, Jesus is tying himself back to Exodus chapter 3. When God decides that it's time to rescue his people from their slave masters, he appears to Moses in a burning bush, And it's this quite awesome and and fearful experience. And God called to him, and Moses said, I'm here. And and God says, well, don't come near. Take off your shoes because the place you stand on is holy ground. Moses was was so afraid and, and so in awe that he hid his face, we're told in the text. And how does God describe himself when Moses stands before him? God describes himself by saying, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham. And I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people out of Egypt. But Moses at this point is 80 years of age. He doesn't want none of it, right? He doesn't want to have to go do that. 
Lord, I'm 80 years of age. I'm, I don't want to do this. I don't have the energy for this. They won't follow me. You want to send me? What would I even say when I go? The people won't believe me. What do I tell them? Who do I tell them sent me? If they want to know your name, what do I say? And God responds to him, I am. You tell them that I am sent you. It's a very powerful and pivotal moment in the Old Testament. So when Jesus gives these I am statements, I am the true vine, he is drawing a straight line to God the Father. He is saying, I am the God of the Old Testament. I am equal to the God of the Old Testament. And so what first century listeners and subsequent readers hear is that Jesus is God and is claiming to be equal with God. That's what they hear. So scripture teaches us that, that God is three in one. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. It's the critical doctrine of the Trinity. And here we get a piece of it. Here we're to understand that Jesus is not almost a God. He's not a lesser God. He's not somebody who has attained his deity by making the right decisions in life. That Jesus was and is God. That's the significance of these I am statements. He is one with the God of the Old Testament. And this is really, really important. Why is it important? Because a lot of people, kind of this growing little movement of people that say things like, uh, I'm a spiritual person, but I'm not religious kind of people. They say things like, I don't like the God of the Old Testament. I don't like that God. He's a God of anger. He's a God of wrath. And I, and I reject that God. Now, I like Jesus, and I like some of the things he has to say in the New Testament, but I don't like the God of the Old Testament. The God of the Old Testament is a God of wrath, and if that's all there is, then I'm out. So what they think they can do is they can pit and separate God of the Old Testament with Jesus of the New Testament. And uh, as if they're completely unconnected deities and foreign to each other. So I like Jesus. He's a God of love, but... But man, God the Father, he's not. He's a God of wrath. And the God in the Old Testament, I like him. So they separate God the Father and God the Son. They, many go even further than that. And they separate the Bible itself. There are many people along those lines who now call themselves red-letter Christians. If you're not familiar with what that is, it's not connected to the translations of the Bible. But some publishers several years ago thought it would be kind of cool to take the words of Jesus and put them in red. So maybe you have a Bible that has that. There's nothing wrong with that. Just to show you where Jesus is actually speaking. But out of that has come a false teaching and a heresy, really. As if the only words that are important in the Bible or the only words of God are the ones in red. But, but that's, a, that's a heresy. That's a total misunderstanding and, 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 uh, and, and, and false teaching on who God is and what the Bible says about itself. The Bible says that all of it is the very breathed out word of God. But people do that, and they call themselves red-letter Christians, and they're spiritual but not religious. And uh, they do so without really reading all the words of Jesus. They think that maybe the words of Jesus are softer and less demanding and less judgy. But when Jesus says, I am, he is saying, I and the Father are one. In fact, Jesus says that in other places, I and the Father are one. And so if you consider yourself a red-letter Christian and you follow Jesus' words, you have to be a whole Bible Christian because Jesus will not allow himself to be separated from the God of the Old Testament. And Jesus affirms and repeats the words in the Old Testament. Jesus was and has tied himself to the Old Testament. By the way, the very idea that there's no grace in the Old Testament is a total misreading of the Old Testament. Grace and mercy are everywhere, all over the Bible and in the Old Testament. One quick example, we were talking about this in our men's study, one quick example is the flood. You mean the flood when God wiped out the entire earth? That's an example of God's mercy. That's an example of God's grace. Are you sure about that? How in the world is that an example of God's grace and, and God's mercy? Once mankind is at the point where God says, I will blot you out because your sin is exceedingly wicked, he still allows them 120 more years to repent. 120 years, it's right in the text in Genesis 6. 
Don't make the mistake of thinking that uh, humanity was clueless, that they lived in this utopia, in this paradise, and mean old God comes along to just ruin all of it. They knew what they were doing was rebellion. In those days, the earth would have been a terrible, terrible place to live. They knew it was rebellion. You understand the timeline of how long, like even like Adam lived, we're told in Scripture, that Adam would have been on the planet and alive for many of them. They would have crossed their timelines. They would have had first-person stories and second-person stories from the fall. If they knew what was going on. They knew what they were doing. They knew that they were living in direct rebellion to God. And then God calls this man Noah, and he tells him of the coming judgment, and he tells him, build an ark. And so Noah builds this ark. And it takes them 120 years. 120 years it takes them to build the ark. Uh, wives, you think your husband takes a long time with, uh, with his home improvement projects? You could be married to Noah. Or like 120 years. All the while in 2 Peter, we're told that all the while Noah's building this. And people are just gathering from all over the world. This is like the, the first wonder of the world. He's building this massive ark on dry land. What, what is this? What's going on? And so as people come and gather and watch, Noah takes time and he stops and he preaches continually. The judgment of God is coming. But there is a way of salvation. There is room for you. Repent. Noah does that for 120 years. In 120 years, God withholds judgment. Noah's building this spectacle, preaching repentance. And you know what happens? Not one single person on the face of the earth repents. Not one. They could have. There could have been room. I would venture so much to say if, if there would have been a great repentance of the people that God would have withheld judgment entirely. That's one of many examples of the mercy and the grace of God in the Old Testament. It's the very essence of who God is, a God who is rich in mercy, whose grace just overflows. And on the flip side, you don't think there's judgment and wrath in the New Testament? Anybody ever read the book of Revelation? Anybody ever read who's sitting on the white horse? Jesus is. And what he does on that white horse when he leads the charge? You cannot separate God the Father, and God the Son. You cannot reject one and keep the other. It's all or nothing. It's all or nothing. This is the significance behind the statement, I am the true vine. Jesus is one with the God of the Old Testament. All the listeners knew what he was saying. It's why these statements were so radical and why they wanted him dead. Here's the second thing. The true vine is the source of life. The true vine is the source of life. Look at look what Jesus says. The branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. Apart from me, you can do nothing. So Jesus is the source of life. Jesus is the true vine. There's no other source. The branch cannot bear fruit by itself. Right? We're told, apart from me, you can do nothing. And, and Jesus is this master illustrator. He loves to use objects on hand or objects within sight and bread and lilies and water, just to name a few. And so here's Jesus using the vine. And the vine was a staple in the Middle East for both food and drink. If you had any property, if you had any property at all, you were liable to have some sort of vineyard in the ancient Middle East. They, like Whataburgers in Texas, like vineyards were everywhere. So you can envision Jesus looking out the window as he's speaking to his disciples, and he sees a vineyard, and he uses and pulls from that vineyard in this illustration. If you were looking out on the hillside and you didn't see sheep, you would see a vineyard. So Jesus is painting this word picture. He is the vine. He is the true vine. He is the one source of life. And his disciples, all of them, including us, we are the branches. And Jesus is saying the only way, the only way a branch survives, the only way a branch thrives and lives is by being attached to the vine. You cut that branch off, you separate it from the vine, and it dies. For it to live, for it to thrive, it must be attached to the vine. And Jesus adds more. He goes on to say that the Father is the vine dresser. So keep that in the back of your mind here because we're going to come back to that here in our final point. We'll return to it. But for now, understand Jesus is the vine. We're the branches. God the Father's the vine dresser. And he cares 
for the vine and all of the branches. So Jesus is this source of life. Nothing else. No one else is that source. The very same sap, the very same life that flows through Jesus flows through every single one of his disciples. Well, just how serious is Jesus about this metaphor in this picture? How real is it? Well, I'll give you a glimpse from another story in the book of Acts. In the book of Acts, we have this great insight about how real God is about this. Pre-conversion, the apostle Paul, Saul, right, was one of the great persecutors of the early church. Dragging away, beating, putting to death early followers of the way. Putting them in prison, putting them to death. That's what he did. And one of the very first deacons in the early church is Stephen. And Stephen is stoned for evangelizing. And as the crowds drag him out to stone him, they begin to take off their outer cloaks so they can get a better wind-up and really take a stone and throw it upside his head. And as they do that, they lay their outer cloaks at the feet of Saul. He's probably most likely the instigator, right? He is the leader of this. And he's signing on the death warrant for Stephen. And so when this Saul is on the road to Damascus and Jesus confronts him and, and, and ultimately he's converted, all right, he's about to go to Damascus to do more persecuting. Jesus appears to him and we're told that Paul is blinded by the appearance of Jesus. He's blinded by the event and he's laying on the ground in humility and fear. And what are we told the very words of Jesus are? Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Why are you persecuting me? It gives us a glimpse of how serious Jesus is about the idea that he is the vine and we are the branches. How serious he is that we draw life from him. Jesus is that source. The unity is so real that Jesus tells Paul that by persecuting Stephen, by persecuting the church, he is persecuting him. That's why when people say things like, I love Jesus, but not his church. They ought to think twice. I get the idea behind it. There are some bad churches out there. There are some bad people in churches, and so I get the understanding. But if you're going to make that dichotomy, you've got to understand that when you say those things, how closely the Bible ties Christ to his people, to his church. Another metaphor that we're given is that the, the church is the bride of Christ. So how's that going to go if you tell somebody, hey, man, I love you, I appreciate you, I cannot stand your wife. She's terrible. How's that going to go over? That, that, that kind of phrase does not work. I love Jesus, not his church. It doesn't work. That's how serious, that's how serious God is about this. The true vine is the source of life. Jesus is the true vine. We are the branches. He is the source of life for every believer. So if you don't have Jesus, you don't have life. We draw our life and our energy from him. Verse 4, the branch cannot bear fruit by itself. You will not make it on your own. You won't make it drawing life and strength from any other source. Your career, your money, nothing in this universe can give you life and strength apart from Christ. And so the question we have to ask ourselves is, am I abiding in Christ? Am I drawing strength and hope and love from him? Am I following him? Really important for us to understand that this is not about what it takes to be a Christian. Like if you want to be a Christian, abide. One verse that kind of shows us that here is verse 3. Jesus says to his disciples, you are already clean. You're already clean. He's talking to all of his disciples. So the question is not, have I done enough for God to love me? Have I done enough for God to to accept me, for God to save me? Have I done enough for God to keep me saved? No, no, abide in Christ. What does he mean by that? He means Christian, by faith that you have placed in Jesus, you've been attached to him. Now abide and draw your strength and life from him. Every single day, center yourself around the fact that God loves you. Every day. So back to the new year, new me, right? Going to read the Bible through in a year. Right, new year, new me, two weeks in now. Are you still on Genesis 3? All right, are you still there? Like, man, again, fifth year in a row. Like, that's why we all know Genesis 1-1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth because like 10 years in a row, we're going to read the Bible through in a year, and Genesis 1-1, we start there. And three weeks in, we're already way behind, and man, it just doesn't seem like it's going to work. 
God's love for you has not changed. He's not on the throne saying, what a loser. They can't get through the book of Genesis. Or 10 years in a row they tried to read their Bible and they only made it to 1 Chronicles when Shesh Bazar begat Shesh Bazar and like I can't even pronounce those words. Like God is not on the throne saying you're such a loser. It's not how he works. When he saved you, when he called you to himself, he did so knowing all of the sin that you would continue to commit. He did so knowing all of the failures and the shortcomings that you have and would have. And yet he still saved you. And he still loves you. And he calls you son. And he calls you daughter. And you bring him joy. He delights in you. What incredible love is that for uh, the love of God? And so abide in that love. So what if it takes 14 months to read your Bible through for the first time? So what if it takes 18 months? So what if it takes three years? Keep at it. Plow ahead. Finish that goal. Stick with it. Not to make God love you. He loves you. In fact, because God loves you, keep going. Abiding in that love, you know what it does? It produces strength. It produces perseverance. It produces endurance. God's love for me is not based on my performance. He loves me because he loves me. And we can let that love be the source of our strength and give us life. The true vine is the source of life. And here's the last thing, and we're done today. The true vine produces fruit. Those who are attached to Jesus, the true vine, will produce fruit. It's a fact. Verse 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. Jesus is the vine. We're told that God the Father is the vine dresser. Verse 2 tells us that what God does to those who are attached to Christ, every branch that does bear fruit, he does what? He prunes that it may bear more fruit. Well, being fruitful, of course, is a good thing. And, uh, you know, so you're thinking, well, being fruitful, bearing fruit, it's working, doing what we're designed to do. And what is, but what does God do to those who are producing fruit? He cuts them back. He trims them up. And, you know, on one side, like, well, why? Does, does it mean he prunes them? You know, you know what you get for growing and for producing fruit? You get the knife. Now, my gardeners here, like the brats, they know, they know, right? They know why that is and how important pruning is to the life of the plant. You know what good pruning does? It makes the difference between a, a plant or a rose bush that flourishes and one that, that wilt, withers and wilts away. You ever ask God why? Like, like why? Of course you have. I, I love you, and I'm obeying you, and I feel like I'm doing the right things right now, God, and you're blessing it. And so why would you give me this right now? Why this? Why now? And there could be hundreds of reasons. God is doing hundreds of things and thousands of things at any one moment at any time. But one giant answer to our why God, why this right now as a Christian is he's pruning you. He's growing you. He's prepping you to do what? To flourish, to produce more fruit. The knife is never pleasant, but the knife is good when it's used in the hand of God. You know, to the untrained eye, watching an expert gardener cut away at like a rose bush or a great perennial, like, what are you doing? You're ruining that beautiful plant. What are you doing? But wait till you see it and all of its glory as a result of that pruning. Things happen at times for us, and from our perspective, it's the wrong time. God, it's the wrong way. Why now? Why so severe? It doesn't make sense to us, and we must walk by faith. One of the major answers to the question why is that in order so that we can do what? Bring more fruit. Why? Because he loves you. And he wants you to be healthy and more fruitful. You ever been around somebody who, man, you're in their presence and you're like, wow, what a life. Like you're around them and you can't help but be impacted by their presence and by their story and by what's happening in their life. You go away kind of like, man, you go away a little bit changed. Almost certainly, almost certainly, it's because that individual or that family has been brought through a very great difficulty. Almost every time, some of the best life experiences, 
you and I have ever had, the great seasons of growth as a person, as a couple, as a family, they have come by enduring things that if we had the ability to avoid, we would avoid. They have come by enduring things that if it were up to us, we say, nope, I'm going to take a different route because why would I want to go through that? But now having endured it, God has grown you. He's produced fruit from it and through it in your life. You see, God is in the business of producing fruit. He is the vine dresser, and he prunes those branches for growth. So, you know, looking at the times, and look what we've been through. It's a difficult time for the, the broader church for a, a bunch of ways. What a, what a year we've been through in every single way, all of us. You know, I got, I got boys about to go off to college, and several of you do too. And then on the other side, we've got three new little ones born in the last couple months to the church. Three new little ones. So, you know, what do you think, Jason? What do you think? Are you, are you scared and nervous about raising kids in this world? Are you scared about the future? Well, yeah, a little, if I, if I allow myself to be a little. And all these little ones and all these big ones and everybody in between and every, everybody of all ages. But I remember the promise that God says he will build his church. He will build his church. And I think about how God saw fit to at this time to assemble the people that are here of all ages, all the families, all the little ones, all the older ones, everybody, all the, to, to be in this church, to be the children of these parents, and to be around all these tremendous people. And I mean tremendous people at the Dove. And you know what that does? That gets me excited. Thinking about all the little world changers walking our halls. Think about all the little world changers getting their diapers changed right now, right? The mission fields that all these kids will reach, the people they'll love, the gospel they'll preach, all this pruning that God is doing in your life and in my life and the way he's just intent on making fruit, the, the fruit that will be produced that he will see to it. So am I a little nervous? Yes. But sleeves up, man. Jaw set, chin tucked, eyes on Christ, abiding in him. Let's get after it in 2021 in Jesus' name. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the great truth of Scripture. Lord, give us grace and strength to abide and to center ourselves in your love. Give us, Lord, grace to believe when the pruning knife comes and it doesn't make sense to see what you're cutting away. Give us grace to believe and to hold on in faith knowing that your plan is to produce more fruit. Give us grace for that, Lord, we pray. The instruments are going to play, and here's your time to speak with God. And maybe you're here, and you're not a Christian. And you've always pit the, the God of the Old Testament and separated him from, from the Jesus of the New Testament. And you're seeing the errors of your way today. And you're understanding that the only way to the Father is through Jesus. So maybe you're here, and that's you, and your prayer is, Father, be merciful to me, a sinner, and save me today. And he'll save you. That grace and that mercy will pour down from heaven today. Maybe that's your prayer. Maybe you're here, Christian, and you're struggling with dealing with the way God's pruning right now. And you're struggling to see it. And so your prayer is, God, to give me grace to trust and faith. Give me grace to be here. Maybe you're here and you've got to just center yourself on the love of Christ that you know he has. You've got to reorient yourself today to that. The instruments play 